Welcome to the Stronger Than Steel podcast with your hosts, Austin Davidson and John Keir, talking Steelers all the time. Now, here's Austin and John. Hello, and welcome back to the Stronger Than Steel podcast. My name is John Keir. I am one of your co-hosts, and today we're doing a special edition of the Stronger Than Steel podcast. As our listeners know, we like to have uh, members, fans of the uh, opposing team the Steelers are playing every week as often as possible to talk a little bit about the other team, a little bit of insight as far as how that team is doing and kind of what their perspective is on the matchup. So I'd like to welcome to the show a good uh, good family friend of mine, Jesse Cardinal. He's been a lifelong Saints and Drew Brees fan growing up, a sophomore at the George Washington University. Jesse, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, John. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, no problem. We're very excited, and obviously this is a big-time matchup. The Saints just coming off a huge win on Monday night over the Carolina Panthers. Uh getting a little bit closer to clinching home field advantage throughout the NFC playoffs. They clinched a first round by uh, talk a little bit about that game because the Panthers who were six and two looked like maybe somewhat of a threat to the saints. It was a tough win, but obviously any win on the road over a division opponent is huge and being that much closer to home field advantage has to be big. Yeah. I mean, following the Rams loss to the Eagles on Sunday night, um, the, the saints really, they didn't need a win, but a win helps them not only need one win out of their final two games in order to clinch the one seed. So it was a big, it was a big team win, and like you said, it came on the road. But what a lot of people don't notice is that that was the third road game in a row that the Saints had played, and the second straight against the division opponent. They played their one game against Thursday night or against the Falcons on Thursday night, and then they played another Thursday night against the Cowboys. And then they played on the road at Tampa, the only team that had beat them so far, and beat them, and then went on the road against Carolina. So they were finishing up a four-game stretch of really tough games of Thursday night, on the road Thursday night, on the road against the only team that beat you, and on the road against another division rival on so, Monday night. So they, you know, it was a very important game to win. And I, I think you look at the score of 12-9 and you think, oh, wow, what a defensive struggle. I, I would argue that it wasn't. I think that the Saints absolutely dominated that game. The defense was swarming. The only touchdown the Panthers scored was on a trick play by McCaffrey to the tight from to no to some no name tight end, and then the two points was off a Drew Brees uh, two point interception return. So the Panthers' offense, the traditional offense of the Panthers, did not really score any sort of points. Um, and then offensively, the Saints had about six or seven plays of about 20 yards that got pulled back, whether it was a penalty or or some other form of, um, again, penalty that just took back the game. I know Michael Thomas had a 25-yard completion that got pulled back for a face mask to try to get extra yards. Uh, there was a Ben Watson catch that got pulled back. There was a Mark Ingram run that got pulled back and a Kamara run that got pulled back because of penalty. So the game, I really thought, was dominated by the Saints, and penalties kind of ruined the offense, but I thought that their defense played phenomenal. So the Saints, with the win, improved to 12-2. and Let's uh, take a step back, kind of take a look at the Saints' season from like a 30,000-foot view. Any discussion about the New Orleans Saints this year, or really in years past, ever since they won the Super Bowl back in 2010 uh, for the 2009 season, your discussion usually starts with quarterback Drew Brees. And while everybody's been talking about the production and uh, the success of 41-year-old Tom Brady, people seem to have forgotten about the 39-year-old Drew Brees. And I'm sure uh, I remember seeing your activity on Twitter. I forget which game it was. I think it was against the uh, Redskins on Monday night when he broke the uh, uh, Red Favre's record, right? Uh, He's having uh, one of his most efficient, I believe his most efficient season to date, He's, throwing, he's thrown 31 touchdowns and only five interceptions, which is on pace for the lowest total of his career. Can you talk a little bit about the season he's having and what he's doing better this year than he has in seasons past? Yeah, so uh, Drew Brees has historically been known as a pro- prolific passer um, because he's had to throw the ball 600 to 650 times you know, for like 10 straight years because they had a horrid defense in New Orleans. And over the past two years, last year he only threw eight picks, and this year he's thrown five, I mean, four of which have come in the 
last four weeks. Uh, so he had one pick through 10 games to begin with, so he was on a torrid pace. But um, he's been more efficient now because the defense has stepped up, and he's been able to rely on, rely on running backs Mark Ingram and Alvin Kamara. And um, I, I've always believed, and the statistics prove it, that Breeze has been the most accurate passer in NFL history. And you see it with um, guys like Tom Brady. You know, they need a perfect pocket to deliver the ball. Drew Brees does not need a perfect pocket to deliver the ball. You know, he, he got creamed by Julius Peppers on Monday night and delivered a strike to Keith Kirkwood on the third and 14 that basically sealed the game because the Saints ran the clock out after nine minutes of having the ball to close out the fourth quarter. And, you know, that's, that's exactly the kind of season he's having. Even at age 39, which is going to be 40 in about 20 days, um, he he still steps into his throws, unlike the quarterback in New England, and he's able to minimize his errors because he has not changed one bit, except for the fact that he's throwing 100, 150 left passes every year over the past couple of years. So you talked about the shift over from a dynamic passing game, still a very good passing game, of course, but now uh, an offense that's featuring two uh, really good running backs in Alvin Kamara and Mark Ingram, who I I can't think of a duo that's better than them right now. So let's talk a little bit about those two running backs because they've both been very successful the last couple of years, but they're kind of different, aren't they? Like, what do each of them do very well? Well, if I told you that Alvin Kamara weighs the exact same amount of weight as Mark Ingram, would you believe me? I would not, no. I mean, I... I I, I think of those two running backs, I, I don't think of them as, as being the same weight. I think of Ingram as being probably the bigger, stronger guy. They are exactly the same weight. Kamara and Ingram both weigh 215 pounds. But you'd never know that with the way that they run. Ingram runs as a bruiser, and Kamara runs as kind of a scat back. But they can both do the other thing, right? Like, Ingram just doesn't try to truck people like Brandon Jacobs. Ingram can out-juke you. He can spin-move you. He can truck you if he needs to, and Kamara can do all three as well. Now, he might be better at juking than he is at trucking, but he can still do it, right? And so I think, well, a lot of people think that you stop Ingram between the tackles and you have to stop Kamara outside of the tackles. You have to defend both players, both inside and outside, which is what presents such a tough matchup for opposing defenses, and that's why they're both very successful. And uh, they've certainly been aided by what pound for pound is one of the best, if not the best, offensive lines in the league. Uh, they've certainly been really good at protecting Drew Brees, and they've been critical to opening up the holes for the running backs. Just how good is this offensive line, and what do they mean to this offense? I would say that by far this is the best offensive line in football. I mean, you talk about Teron Armstead, who has an injury history, you know, as long as as long as the eye can see. But when he's in there, he's a Pro Bowl player. As of right now, PPF has him as the highest-graded tackle in the game. Yeah, follow him up with the left guard, Anders P., who's just a mauler. He just, he just moves people. That's all he does. You got Max Unger, who is kind of the symbol of the Saints' turnaround. I mean, they traded him in Seattle for Jimmy Graham, and that kind of is what made this team a tougher, tougher, more physical um, strong running team. And so it all starts with Max Un Unger, who unfortunately got a concussion last Monday. But, um, you know, I, I think he'll be back sooner rather than later. So you have an all-pro left tackle. you got a mauler at left guard. You have an incredible Pro Bowl center, Max Unger. And then they signed a right guard um, in the, before the 2017 season named Larry Warford from the Detroit Lions. And Warford is, Warford is also a mauler. He's very very much like Pete in that way. And then they drafted a guy named Ryan Ramchek, I believe out of Wisconsin, and he was the backup to longtime right tackle Zach Streif. And when Streif got or was injured in week one against the Vikings last year, Ramchek stepped in and is now, I believe, the sixth best tackle in the football. So they have two of the top six tackles, two mowers at guard, and, and a four-time pro bowler, I believe, at center. So... And, and they're all protecting Drew Brees, who at six foot needs to stand on his tiptoes to see over them. So they create very, very favorable passing lanes for him to get the ball through. So they obviously have a, a Hall of Fame quarterback. They've got two dynamic running backs, one of, if not the best offensive line in the league. You just outlined all the standouts on their starting line. And really the only 
if you can even call it a weakness, is the fact that they don't have many established weapons in the receiving game outside of Michael Thomas. Now, that's not to say they don't have some talented players. They have Benjamin Watson, who's been doing it forever, and a host of other receivers, including Taysom Hill. And I want you to, I want to hear what you uh, think about Taysom Hill. But just what what has Michael Thomas meant to this team? And outside of them, why why is it why is it that these other guys uh, that are contributing maybe not getting as much attention? Well, a lot of uh, I'll start with the undrafted rookie free agents. You know, a lot of them are exactly that undrafted rookie free agents. You have the backup tight end, the third string tight end Dan Arnold, who's made some plays. You got Keith Kirkwood, Austin Carr. I mean, I mean Tommy Lee Lewis. I mean, you just don't hear of these people because they're undrafted. Uh, Tommy Lee Lewis isn't a rookie, but you have you know all those rookie free agents who have made a voice because of Ted Ginn's you know torn knee, who. Sean Payton said might actually make a return soon. And so the Saints' weakness in terms of their wideouts is that nobody can go over the top, right? Nobody takes the defense or the top off of the defense anymore once Ted Ginn's gone. But I think that they're going to be getting him back for the postseason, which spells um, a lot of trouble for defenses. You know, And so you talk about talented guys with the undrafted rookie free agents. You talk about a guy that's coming back in Ted Ginn. You talk about the ageless wonder that is Ben Watson at 38 with seven kids. I mean, jeez. <laughs> and then you get to Michael Thomas, who is catching balls at a ridiculous, like, 86% catch rate. You know, when Drew Brees, the most accurate passer in football, throws the ball to Michael Thomas, it gets caught. It just does. And he has just meant so much because for the first time in his career, Drew Brees is a pro bowl receiver. He, in all the years with Lance Moore, Devery Henderson, Robert Meacham, Marcus Colston, he has never had a Pro Bowl wide receiver. And now he has a guy that if in trouble, he can just throw the ball up to and know he's going to get it 75 to 80% of the time. So Michael Thomas is a great new safety blanket that Drew Brees has really kind of never had at the wide receiver position before. My co-host Austin loves Michael Thomas, and uh, he he's always thought, uh, at least going into this year, that he was – maybe disrespected in national circles a little bit, and he thinks this has been a, a very good year for him. So I'm, I just want to hear kind of your thoughts on where Michael Thomas stands as far as the rest of the league looking at him, because we both think of him as very, very good elite, an elite wide receiver, but he, he doesn't seem to be mentioned in that top tier. I think part of the problem with uh, the recognition with Michael Thomas is I think his speed. I think he ran... Um, either a four four or four five, which is which is you know respectable, but not that's not crazy at the wide receiver position. And so when you compare it to guys like a T. Y. Hilton or an Antonio Brown or an OBJ that can just stretch the field and take the top off the defense if they need to, uh, I, I think he I think he's less in that category of um, speed than those other guys. And then you compare him to a guy like DeAndre Hopkins, who can just I mean. Wow, that guy's ridiculous. I mean, that, that, that guy's insane. And so I think when you when you talk about Michael Thomas, I have him just outside my top five wide receivers. Um, I, obviously, you got to go with you know Brown from Pittsburgh. I mean, that guy's just I mean, it's ridiculous, especially at his height, what he what he's able to accomplish. Um, you know, you got DeAndre Hopkins, and and you, you just have Adam Thielen who's doing really well. You just have all these different kind of guys, and I think Michael Thomas gets lost in the shuffle. Because despite his 85% catch rate, he's not viewed as being the best at any one thing, right? He's like a he's a solid A minus in just about everything: speed, um, hands, route running, anticipation. He's an A minus in just about everything. And you can name a guy that's better in certain areas. I think that's why he gets lost because he's just he's just a hair off in just about every category. But when you add it all up, that makes him one of the best wide receivers in the league. Let's shift gears here. Let's go on the other side of the football. The Saints defense, you know, it's quietly become an elite defensive unit this season. I know they've struggled a bit against the pass, but they've been so dominant against the run, especially in a season where defense has gone by the wayside for so many teams. Has it just been the play of individual standouts when it comes to run defense, or are they just a technically sound unit that plays so well together? Or maybe, I guess, it's probably both. Well, a lot of times uh, the Saints are associated with the terrible defenses that they fielded under Rob Ryan, um, you know, and and Dennis Allen for a little bit there. But a lot of that was, I thought, from missed tackles, right? They've always kind of had a number one corner, whether that was a Tracy Porter, 
or um, a Jabari Greer, Keenan Lewis or Delvin Bro. They always had a number one corner that kind of emerged, and they were always relied on that guy to take out the number one. And over the past two years, they've had Marshawn Lattimore, who's been able to do that. And when you take away a team's best weapon, you're then able to roll coverage to the other side and help out your number two corner, Eli Apple, who's you know starting to perform. I mean, he had a couple gaps against Dallas, but again, Dallas only scored 13. Um, so, you, you know, you have a team that's starting to learn how to roll their coverage right, so they're technically sound in that aspect. But they're also not missing many tackles anymore. And if they do, they are rallying to the football like I, I've never seen them. And I think that's in part due to the signing of Demario Davis from the Jets, who led the league in tackles last year. That guy knows how to tackle, he knows how to blitz, and he knows how to cover. You know, the Saints have never had, or since the days of Jonathan Vilma, a linebacker that can do all three. I think when you have a linebacker that can do all three, it frees up the rest of the defense to do what they're really good at. You know, they, they have a linebacker named Alex Anzalone, who's very good in coverage. They have a linebacker named A.J. Klein, who's very good at stopping the run. And then you have Demario Davis, who's good at both. So if you're trying to stop the run, you can put out Davis and Klein, because you know you're going to stop the run. And if they do play action, you can put Davis on the tight end or a uh, slot receiver who's going to do, you know, what they do in play action, and he's able to stop them. So I think Demario Davis's versatility is a huge part of why they're not missing tackles and rallies to the football and doing what good defenses do. But before I, you know, go off of that, I think the most important player on this defense by far, despite Davis's versatility, is defensive end Cameron Jordan. This guy is a monster and he'll let you know it he is one sack away from setting his career high in sacks at 13 this year uh a mark that he set last year i believe he is the best overall defensive end in the league um that, that may be biased but last year he led the league in passes defensed by a defensive lineman he had 13 sacks i believe he had a pick so many 20 plus tackles for loss i mean this guy is an absolute machine and like i said he'll let you know it i mean he sent a broom and a wine to cam newton last year after they swept him <laughs> three out of three games oh, uh and so you know he, he brings an attitude to the defense that everybody else is really um everybody really feeds off of so you just spoke about cameron jordan and his effectiveness as a player in all aspects what like because the defense or an offensive line has to focus so much on him, how has he helped the other players on this defense? Like you know, uh, Sheldon Rankins has eight sacks this year. As a team, they have forty-five, which I believe is is one the exact same or one less sack than the Steelers have this year. So how much has he meant to opening up the pass rush and really just helping the rest of the defense in general? Yeah. So uh, the Saints have had their first round pick from twenty fifteen. Sheldon Rankins really emerged this year. Uh, his number one uh, pass rush move, which he's able to use in one-on-one -on -one situations because of the kind of attention that Cameron Jordan garners, uh, is a spin move. And this spin move, John, let me tell you, this spin move, he sets it up throughout the game and has told reporters that he waits to use it um, for a critical third and nine or an important point in the game. And I, he, for about... I'll say of his eight sacks, I'll say six have come off this spin move. He sets them up on either shoulder and just in an instant is at the quarterback. He's, a, he's been an absolute animal who shimmy shakes every time he gets to the quarterback, which is a nice, a nice treat to see uh, every Sunday. And then, you know, you got guys like Alex Okafor who have really benefited from, you know, again, the one-on-one -on -one opportunities who came back from a torn Achilles after an eight-sack season with the Cardinals. So you got Okafor on the left defensive end. You got Cameron Jordan on the right. You got Rankins in the middle. And then the other guy joining Rankins is a guy named David Onyemata, who is just so strong. He just says, you will not be running here. And if your quarterback wants to step up, that's not going to happen either. He, he can just move people very similar to how Pete and Warford do so on the offensive line. He just moves offensive linemen, which helps to create opportunities for Rankins, Okafor, and Jordan. You talked about the back end of the defense. It really was a struggle early on, particularly in the opener against the Buccaneers, which was their only <laughs> loss for a long time. 
they've kind of righted the ship in that aspect. Marshawn Lattimore, as you mentioned, he's been playing better. And the addition of Eli Apple from the Giants, he was much maligned out there. He kind of struggled. When I saw that trade, I kind of scoffed at it when I first saw it. I was like, Eli Apple, really? Like, I didn't think he was that much of an upgrade. But you said he's been playing better lately. Can you talk a little bit about what Eli Apple has meant to the defense and just the improvement of the secondary, as you've already touched on a little bit? Yeah, so uh, as Sean Payton has said, he prefers Eli Apple to be to run bump and run coverage, right? He wants guys, he wants Apple pushing guys off the line of scrimmage, uh, affecting the timing of the routes, and getting up in their faces. You know, that, that's where he believes Eli Apple is most effective because Eli Apple is a big, big guy, right? And so I, I believe he's like six two or six three and like two, two ten, two fifteen, something like that. And so you know, and he's got quite the wingspan, so he. When, he, when he's playing bump and run, he does very well. But, you know, when he plays off, he, he doesn't have incredible speed, so he gets burnt at the line of scrimmage. And so over the last few games, you started to see him play a little bit more bump and run after the Dallas game. And guys have not been getting much separation, if anything. And so, and, and that's what resulted in his interception of Cam Newton on Monday night, was him playing bump and run against Funches. Um, and then you have the overall... Uh, secondary. So you got Lattimore shutting guys down on the right. You have Marcus Williams shadowing Eli Apple, saying, I got your back over the top. So Apple just has to worry about what's in front of him and being able to play that bump and run. Marcus Williams, who's a great ball hawk safety. I mean, he, he missed a tackle for the Minneapolis Miracle, which made me cry. But he, you know, he, he's a great ball hawk. I believe he had, uh, I believe he had like some like eight interceptions in his senior year at Utah where he's just this incredible ball, ball hawking safety um, who makes a lot of uh, kind of game-saving plays uh, when things, you know, when the occasional long run happens against this New Orleans defense. And then a guy that I don't think gets a lot of credit is Von Bell. You know, Von Bell is a very hard-hitting safety. You know, a, a lot of people have started mimicking the Seattle Legion of Boom with Chancellor, the enforcer, and... Uh, Earl Thomas, the ball hawk. You know, the Saints got a ball hawk in, in Marcus Williams, and now they got an enforcer in Von, Von Bell. I mean, the Panthers are starting to drive, and DJ Moore had gotten a reverse, um, a reverse handoff or some crazy, and Bell came from the weak side and then ran all the way up, caught him, and forced a fumble, and that changed the momentum of the game, which was starting to turn the Panthers' way. So, you know, you have a guy that hustles to no end in Bell. You have a guy with a chip on his shoulder in Williams. You have a guy that's starting to get more confidence and bump to run, and then you got Marshawn Lattimore, who is one of the best cover corners in the league. So I think the secondary isn't due to one guy's performance, but I believe it's because of increased um, excellence out of all of them. A couple more things I wanted to get to before we shift to this uh, game coming up on Sunday. Uh, first thing, because uh, I I think I forgot to mention him, but Taysom Hill, uh, he's been such a – He's a jack of all trades, unlike I think I've ever seen before. What what has he brought to the team, on, you know, offense and special teams? He's brought um, a light, uh, or he's he put a fire under everybody. You know, I mean, he uh, against Tampa Bay last week, the Saints had scored three points up until his block punt. He blocked the punt, and the Saints ran off twenty five straight. I mean, he is just an energizer bunny for this Saints team, and you know, I, I see. Sean Payton, for example, on Monday night, it was a second and eight. Momentum wasn't really going the Saints way, and he put in Taysom Hill. And I think you should put Taysom Hill in on second and shorts, third and shorts, try to guarantee the first down because he gets just about two or three yards every time uh, if he doesn't break one. And it was second and eight. I was like, what are you doing? We don't have momentum. And Taysom Hill rattled off a 17-yard run. I was like, oh, that's why I'm not a coach of the NFL, right? I mean, th- this guy, you just never know. First of all, where he's going to be. He could be quarterback, tight end, wide receiver, running back. Or on special teams. He could be the gunner. He could be the returner. You know, it just, you just never, the, I mean, the guy who rushes the punter, what's that called? That, that's just an end. But, you know, he's, he's everywhere at the same time, and it really fuels the, the New Orleans team, which is a very emotional team, and he helps feed into that emotion. So using him as the jack of all trades really gives Sean Payton a really cool toy to play with. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about was uh, the home field advantage of the Mercedes-Benz Superdome. So 
for years, years around the Super Bowl and for a few years after, like around, up until around like 2014, 2015, the home field advantage of playing in the Superdome was so, it was, it was magnificent, really. The Saints were such a strong team at home. It kind of went away for a few years, and now the last couple of years it's been back. They've only lost there twice in the past two years. Obviously, uh, the most recent one being in week one of uh, this season, but... I mean, they're they're so tough to beat at home, and just what is like, what's with the magic at the Superdome? Like, what what is it? There is something weird. I mean, a lot of people will talk about you know Drew Brees and his performance, you know, uh, not not having the wind or things to throw off because I think he's got some smaller hands. The ball can flip out if it's windy, but when he's in the dome, there's just a different energy, right? I mean, it, whether it's because the Saints saved the the, the franchise really after Katrina or, or whatever it is there are there, there's just something that happens. Other teams are overwhelmed. Um, I, I remember Nate Burleson was talking about it on good morning football. He was saying, you know, listen, we, we were beating the saints in the dome 17, 10 in the wild card game. And then we lost 45, 28 and we don't even know what happened. Like it just, it just flips a switch. And I think while a lot of people look at the points per game that they score at home, which is you know, I mean, by far over 30, a lot of it, I think, is the defense, where the defense is able to get stops easier because quarterbacks can't hear and you got to go to silent counts, which helps, the off, which helps the defense be able to read and get a head start going uh, in terms of rushing the passer. There's a different, again, there's a different energy with coaches and all these other kinds of nuanced nuanced feelings, I guess, that overwhelm players. And so the defense feeds off of that. And then the Saints, I believe they average about three more possessions a game at home than they do on the road because just playing on the road is a whole different atmosphere for them. And so if they score on two more possessions, right, that's 10 or 14 points, and that's why their points per game are up. So I think that the home field advantage, while it does help Drew Brees, I think that the defense feeds off of it. And I think that the increased amount of possessions leads to an increased amount of points where Breeze will carve you up and the Saints will win. So that definitely speaks to the turnaround of the defense from the last couple of years, as you mentioned. So that definitely makes sense. Let's uh, let's move into this game. So the Saints at 12-2, and two, you mentioned they, they only need one more win to lock up home field advantage now. Uh, the... I, the Rams and Bears are, the, I believe, the only other teams. I think only the Rams actually could get home field advantage, if I'm not mistaken. I think the Bears are too far off, right? The Bears, I don't believe, can, because even if the Saints were 12-4 and four and the Bears were 12-4, and four, I believe the Saints would have a better conference record. But I'm not sure about that. All right. Uh, well, in either case, the the real threat is the Rams, and with the Rams playing the garbage of the NFC West, that is the <laughs> Arizona Cardinals and San Francisco 49ers, there's still a good amount on the line here. You never want to leave a big game up to, uh, you know, a season finale against a division opponent, even if you just beat that opponent two weeks ago. There's still a lot on the line for the Saints here against the Steelers this week. The Steelers obviously just came off a huge win against the New England Patriots that nobody really saw coming. Uh, so there's a lot on the line for both these teams here. And as far as the Steelers' offense goes, they've been good at times this year. They've never had trouble moving the football, but they've had red zone turnovers from Ben Roethlisberger, and they've struggled getting in the end zone at times. Case in point, they ran for 40 yards and averaged just two yards a carry against the worst rush defense in the league in Oakland, where they only scored 21 points. And then followed that up with a 158-yard performance last week against the Patriots. And they've also had several games where the offense has just exploded. So, really, you know they're going to move the ball every week. The question is, are they going to score? Uh, how do you feel the Saints' defense is going to try to prepare for them? Because, obviously, with the league's top rushing defense, the Steelers have gone more pass-happy in uh, recent weeks this year. I would expect more of the same this week. So, what, what would you do or expect the Saints on defense to do this week? I think that they're going to try and stuff the run to begin with uh, because that, that's what they do, right? They, they make you one-dimensional so that Cam Jordan, Rankins, Okafor, and Anjumata can pin their ears back and just go right after the quarterback. Uh, Dennis Allen likes to bring pressure, and I think if the Steelers 
are going to win in New Orleans. I think that they have to run it with Jalen Samuels. Is that his name? I think they gotta. I think they have to establish some sort of ground game, and I think New Orleans knows that. Um, because while I think Pittsburgh's offense with Smith Schuster and Antonio Brown and Vance McDonald, um, you know, I, I, while I think that they're prolific, and, and Ben Roethlisberger as well, I do not think that if it came down to a shootout, I do not think the Steelers would win. I think. I think Breeze and Thomas, Kamara and Ingram in that building um, with Sean Payton, who I, I'd argue is the most prolific offensive coordinator in football, despite Magna, Matt Nagy and Sean McVay's genius. Um, you know, the, I do not think the Pittsburgh Steelers can win in a shootout. However, I will say the only way that team has won this far in the Superdome is through a shootout. Uh, and that was the Bucks, but I think the Saints have made such strides on defense. I mean, they've only allowed 12.8 points per game over the last six games. I mean, that's that's stellar. That's the best in the league. And so I think the Pittsburgh Steelers will have to try and establish the run because I think if they get in a shootout, I think Lattimore, Apple, Williams, or Bell, or somebody in that secondary is going to make a play. And I think because, you know, Ben, as good as Ben is with in terms of yards, he's not very clutch in terms of, you know, not being able to not turn the ball over, right? He, he turns it over at the most inopportune times. And I think a Saints secondary, which is scrappy and eager to try and get the offense back on the field, will have a have a good time with Ben Roethlisberger if, if it's just pass happy. So I think the Steelers are going to try and establish the run. And I think I don't think it's going to work because the Saints have the best rush defense. And you said the Steelers have a hot and cold running game. And I believe James Conner is still injured. Is that correct? Yeah, there's uh, there are talks of him coming back this week. Uh, we're not. It's obviously too early in the week to know for sure. But even if they do play him, I'd imagine there's going to be some sort of split between him and Samuels, given how Samuels just played this past week. Yeah, Samuels definitely helped my fantasy team. I'll tell you that. <laughs> but you know, it's. I, I think they're going to have to establish the one. I think that's their path to victory. Um, but I think if it's a shootout, I think they get in a closer game, but still lose. I think running running game, you're either you're playing you're playing it risky in terms of either getting blown out or winning. But a shootout, I think, guarantees a loss for Pittsburgh. So I think they're going to try and establish the running game. So ball ball control is essentially what you think the Steelers need to do to win this game. Right. I mean, as you say, you know, they're able to move the ball a lot throughout the year. Uh, at the beginning of the year, the Saints defense had about a 72% rate of uh, allowing touchdowns in the red zone. And so, the, you know, a lot of teams were scoring touchdowns, but that's because a lot of teams were down there, right? So teams are able to move the ball against New Orleans, but this defensive turnaround has been an increased stoppage in the red zone. And so I think Pittsburgh needs to get those yards to move the ball, you know, staying in bounds when you're running the ball or instead of going out of bounds and stopping the clock for 15 seconds. I think you got to stay in bounds when you're running the ball, short completions. I think you got to keep the ball going in order to get your yardage, and then you have to convert touchdowns. And so I think ball control is really the path for the Steelers to take. I would agree. I think you definitely expect a lot of short passes that are kind of an extension of the running game, especially if Samuels is playing. I would not expect a lot of – I wouldn't expect more than like 15 designed runs, uh, you know, unless if they're leading and trying to run out the clock. I'd expect a lot of – short passes because that's kind of what they did against new england too you didn't see a ton of deep passes that were converted you saw a lot of spreading them out and just taking what the defense gave them so i think it's going to have to be something similar this week for the steelers offense now on the other side the steelers defense is statistically a pretty solid unit they've really struggled in making big plays and timely stops outside of last week which was a shocking change and we know the saints are really a powerful running team right now that likes to set up the pass but We've seen Drew Brees getting shootouts his whole career, and he's been successful. So really it's just, I, I don't know what the Steelers are going to do on defense. Their one hallmark has been getting after the quarterback this year, and they've done a good job of it. Even only getting one sack against Tom Brady last week, they were in the backfield a lot. It's going to be tougher this week, obviously, given how good the Saints' offensive line is and how quickly Drew Brees gets the ball out. But the Steelers' rush defense has been okay. It's been good. They're statistically solid as well. But teams have been able to run the ball on them. The Patriots did it pretty well last week, but kind of got away from it. If you're Sean Payton, you're coming up with an offensive game plan. 
what do you what are you doing? I guess what what kind of game plan are you making? I am running the ball down the Pittsburgh Steelers' throat because, despite the Saints' offense having these prolific passing numbers, Drew Brees is at his best when you have the strong running game, strong play action game, and a strong screen game, and all of those focus around having the running backs have an important, impactful um, part of the game. And so if the Saints can establish the run, particularly the outside run, whether that be zone or, or tosses or counters or reverses, whatever it is, if, they can, if the Saints can establish the outside, like offset running game, it's, uh, I mean, I don't think Pittsburgh has a chance. So um, because while Aaron and Kamara can both run, up, or run inside, their ability to run outside and the Saints' offensive line is athletic, especially Teron Armstead. So I'm, I'm hoping that he's back for this game because I believe T.J. Watt um, will line up against Armstead, and if that's the case, Armstead ran the fastest time, the, the fastest 40 time for an offensive lineman in combine history. Uh, as, so as an ex-tight end, you know, he, I believe he would be able to keep up with the speed of T.J. Watt, um, but I wouldn't want a tester coming off injury. So if I'm Peyton, I'm trying to find as many outside runs as I can for Ingram, Kamara, or even Taysom Hill. Um, because I think the Steelers don't have a Shazier anymore who can run sideline to sideline. And so I think if you can get Ingram or Kamara against anybody in the secondary for Pittsburgh, because, I mean, Joe Hayden is a great cover corner, but I, don't, I, I, I think Kamara and Ingram win every single time against Joe Hayden. So I think you've got to get that outside run zone or the outside run going if you're Peyton. And if you can't do that, then try to run up the middle. I think it should be a run-oriented attack by New Orleans. So now that we've kind of laid down the foundation for what we expect to see from both sides, can you give me an X factor on offense and defense for the Saints, kind of an important player that might be flying under the radar but you still, you still think is going to have a huge impact on Sunday's game? Start with offense for me. I will start with Will Lutz for offense. How's that? That works. I think, <laughs> I, I think the kicker for New Orleans, I th- he's made 24 straight field goals. When you, hit at, when you hit field goals at a 97% clip, you give the offense such ambiguity to work because if you know you can stop at the 37-yard line and then come back next series and your kicker is going to make a 54-yard field goal, it gives you so much freedom as an offense and it really takes down the pressure. So I think Will Lutz, Will Lutz's ability to miss two kicks out of his 74-something all year between his extra points and his field goals, I think being having a steady kicker is going to allow New Orleans to really flourish offensively. So I think Will Lutz's presence um, for the offense is going to be absolutely phenomenal. And then on the defensive side, I'm really between Demario Davis and Cam Jordan. I mean... I think, I believe Cam Jordan, who's the Steelers' right tackle? That's not Villanueva, is it? No, it's, uh, it's he's the left tackle. Typically, uh, the last few years it had been Marcus Gilbert, but uh, he is out and on IR this year. They have Matt Filer, who is an, uh, he was an undrafted free agent a few years ago, but he's played, I, I wouldn't say he's, you know, a pro bowler per se, but he's been playing pretty solid. But, I mean, he's still, you know, he, he hasn't faced uh, – an elite pass pass rusher like Jordan, I don't think this year. Yeah. So if had Villanueva been where Cam Jordan lines up, because Cam Jordan lines up on the right side in terms of for the offense, had it been against Villanueva, I would think I would think you know Cam Jordan might struggle a little bit. But I think because he's against um, essentially the backup right tackle, I think you're going to see Samuels or Connor or who's ever in there. I think you're going to see a lot of tight end chips. I think you're going to see a lot of running back chips because I think they're going to try to give them as much help as they can. But I think Jordan finishes with two or three tackles for loss, at least a sack. Um, and I think he will make all the difference on the defensive side because he is going up against essentially a backup right tackle. So uh, now that we've gone over X factors and kind of we've laid down the groundwork for – kind of how we expect this game to go. Can you tell me about how you think this game is going to turn out? Give me a final score prediction. Final score prediction? Just how you think the game is going to go. I think it's going to start off slow uh, because I think the Saints are going to run the ball, but then I think that the running is going to turn into play-action bombs, and I think um, with Drew Brees being one of the – 
the um, most accurate passer of balls 20 yards down the field over the past few years. I think they're going to complete those. And I think while it'll start off slow, it'll finish pretty fast. And I'll say 34-21 Saints. All right. Uh, is there anything else that uh, we might have missed that you wanted to touch on before we wrap things up? Thomas Morstead, the punter for New Orleans, is towards the top of the league in terms of net punt average. He has only he was only needed 18 times throughout the first 10 weeks, averaging 1.8 punts a game. He's been needed more the last few games. Uh, he was ran into uh, on the game against Carolina on Monday. So we'll have to see how that injury pl- plays out. But I think Morstead's impact cannot be um, understated. I think he flips the field very well for New Orleans and puts the defense in a great position to win. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned that. The Steelers' struggles on special teams, they, they were solid against the Patriots uh, as far as special teams themselves go. The Steelers' struggles at kicker and punter, especially kicker Chris Boswell, who went from a season similar to what Lil Lut- Will Lutz is having this year, and he has completely fallen apart. He's only hitting 61% of his field goals, so uh, there's a clear advantage uh, as wide as the Grand Canyon at kicker this week between the Saints and the Steelers and the punter. Jordan Berry has been okay for Pittsburgh, but uh, we have not seen numbers like, I, I just pulled up his stats, 47 yards per punt is an insane average compared to what we're used to seeing in a net of 43 yards per punt is just astronomical. We have not seen that in Pittsburgh at all. So he is clearly doing well, so his health will be important. So it looks like it's going to be a tough game uh, for the Steelers either way, but uh, it lo- I think it'll be an entertaining game, and obviously there's a lot on the line for both teams, so there's going to be no shortage of big moments either way. So, Jesse, I wanted to thank you so much for coming on today, and uh, it's a shame the Steelers and Saints don't play as often, but with the Saints likely being uh, the home field, uh, the team that has home field in the NFC there'll be a strong chance they get to the Super Bowl. And if they get back there, I'd like to bring you back on. So how does that sound if they make it? That would sound fantastic because I would be in a great mood to talk about it. (laughs) All right. Uh, Jesse Cardinal, thank you so much for joining me today on the Stronger Than Steel podcast. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to email the show uh, at strongerthansteelpodcast at gmail.com and check out our website listed in the description below. Uh, for those uh, wanting updates as far as uh, the Saints go, uh, Jesse, you want to provide our listeners with uh, your Twitter username if you have any uh, commentary on the game during the game? Yeah, so my Twitter is at jcardinal, all lowercase, nine. And the nine is for Drew Brees, just so everybody knows. <laughs> all righty. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, have a great night, everybody. I uh, hope you enjoy the game. You have been listening to Stronger Than Steel Podcast. Thank you for joining us today, and don't forget to check out our website listed in the description below.